Okay, can you hear me? Yes, right? Thank you for coming. Um, yeah, Chris, Chris is a great speaker and a great teacher, so it's going to be hard to beat. Um, okay, so let's talk a little bit about open source and agility. Um, so my name is Agustin Benito Betancourt. I'm, I'm from Spain. Um, I've basically been a, somehow a manager all my life. Uh, the last few years a consultant, but yeah, or an entrepreneur or... So, um, and most of my career has been in directly in open source, either working in the open directly, managing teams working in the open, or uh, somehow halfway through the open and R&D or production. Um, I'm also has contributed to uh, several projects, uh, Probably the, the one that I have contributed the most has been KDE since the early 2000s. Um, I work now as a consultant for Coating. Coating is a British company, although it, it has customers worldwide. We are close to 100 people. And basically what Coating does is engineering services and consultancy, mostly very focused on embedded, how to produce software best practices. And um, we are also an open source company, or we like to think that we are an open source company. It was funded by, by open source developers, and we, we do a lot of open source, and we bring open source into customers and the way, the open source way into customers. And well, there are here on the slides a few projects that we lead. We contribute to many, from the kernel to system D to desktops, many. And we lead a few somehow. No? And I put there some. Buildstream is a build tool. Uh, well, it's an integration tool, not a build tool. Then BuildGrid is all about remote execution, you know, uh, sending jobs to different data centers so the builds get uh, reduced immensely in the build times, these kind of things. And uh, well, for of SDK, Trustable, and we have, uh, we, all, we have others. OK. so. So the idea is that I'm going to talk a little bit, I'm going to make a first an intro, and then I'm going to go through values, principles, uh, methodologies, and skills uh, as a way to, just by providing personal experiences or my personal point of view, uh, tell you uh, why I think that open source is a great way to um, shorten the, the path for any organization that is trying to move towards becoming, uh, I hate the word, agile, but towards agility. Um, OK, so the first thing is, yeah, every time you, you I start in any consultancy work or any talk, uh, and it's something about even close to what is agile, the first thing you need to do is define the agile, right? So I like to talk about agility to avoid that. Agile can be a brand or can be the manifesto methodologies. You can refer to different things. So I, I like to talk about agility to, about, to avoid the, the, the misuse of the term. And also, I like this idea of always talking about journey, always towards agility as a, as a way to refer to, to this as a process, right? As a journey. Um, too many people is focused completely on methodologies, and, and that is to me, too static, right? So I, I like to refer more to the principles and the values and techniques that can help you to get there. Um, so the first idea is that uh, agile methods were defined and designed a few years back at uh, as team level uh, as team level techniques or methodologies, right? And yeah, it seems companies or many organizations, especially big organizations, are define it and design it as a structure, as team in teams. It works very well when you try to scale them up uh, horizontally, but and then optimize at a team level. But as any local optimization, when you're trying to uh, roll them up, then is when you start to f to see how the limitations. Right? I I study physics, and this is a very well known problem in physics, right? When you're modeling to optimize for uh, uh, local systems and you try to scale up the system, it doesn't work very well. So from the modeling perspective, this is very common, uh, at least 
from my personal point of view. I put there a link to a very well-known talk from a very well-known agilist that points in that direction. Uh, so scaling up uh, me agile methods do not take you to, uh, 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 as an organization, to become agile, or do not take you very far when it comes to uh, be, uh, um, yeah, going through that journey. I mean, it's a necessary step, but it's, it's not the only step. If we focus on, on a little bit on open source, open source focus more on, on communities and in practices, and that provides uh, a lot of fle um, adaptability. Right? So that, that's, that's one of the characteristics of, uh, of open source. And the second one is that when you, when you look back uh, since the the 80s, right, when, when with BSD and, and then with all the work done by the Free Software Foundation and later on Linux. And, and, and you see how open source is today. You, you know, there are quite a few projects that have scaled up a lot, right? So scalability is a characteristic that open source, under certain circumstances, might seem to have. So when, when approaching an organization that is trying to at scale, uh, move towards agility. One of the things that are coming from open source, I say, look, I, what are the things that I have or that I know or that open source have I know that can help in these circumstances? Or if you are leading teams, four or five scrum teams, and you want to scale up the agility process up to this, the, the following level, right, to product definition or portfolio definition better, uh, how do I do that, right? What, what can I take from open source? that helps me. So let's see, I, I want to tell you a few examples that in my opinion, uh, there are so many that it's impossible to cover in a day, but at least I will give you two or three tips. So, so basically a lot of what I do uh, is take those examples, giving them some science or engineering backup and then uh, out of that uh, move into, into practices that you can take to your organization. Right. So let's start by the values. I, insi I insist, I'm going to be very quick. Um, so if we look at the values, and I have to summarize the manifesto into concepts, simple concepts, right? To me, it would be something like team trust, uh, collaboration, and flexibility. Um, trust and collaboration, a lot of people refer to it uh, as transparency. Well, it's not the same, but definitely they are heavily related. Now, when I think about, uh, when I try to think about those concepts applied to open source, I, I come up with different ones, different values. So the first one is consensus. Uh, uh, it's all about transparency. Um, I think that open source take the collaboration concept significantly farther. It's more about co-creation, not just collaboration. And freedom is essential, right? It's not about being only flexible. It's, it's a lot about freedom. So I will focus a little bit on transparency. And um, yeah, because it's related to trust and collaboration. So uh, back in my early days, I, I started in open source. Again, I'm not a developer, right? I started in open source with my own little company. I rediscovered open source. And I thought, you know what? I'm going to turn my IT training company into a software development company. And we're going to do it with open source, because it's whatever. I, I don't remember what I thought back then. I just remember that I wanted to go that way. And I remember back then starting uh, to collaborate with some upstream projects and also with other companies back there in the Canary Islands. And collaborating with other companies, we formed a group. So we were 40 people distributed uh, among the four companies distributed in different islands, right? So it was very natural for me to adopt this concept of mailing list, right? Uh, mailing list. It, it back then, it was revolutionary for me. I, I come from the traditional management part, right? I did physics, but it was a... Uh, yeah, uh, old-fashioned manager. So this mailing list thingy was for me kind of scary, right? Really, a mailing list transparent to all employees, really. That will create a lot of noise. I remember perfectly thinking about that and discussing. And the other guys were, were truly open source entrepreneurs. So it was like, no, look, this is no-brainer. So either you go through this or not. So I had no option. I went through it. And it turned out to be absolutely awesome, right? Having an asynchronous channel where everybody can uh, put there some deep thoughts that you think about deeply and 
and express there and where it doesn't matter what is your title, it's all about your ideas, right? That, that, that was very powerful. Then obviously I, I went into uh, global open source projects and I moved to significantly bigger open source companies and, and now as a consultant, I, I, I keep thinking that it's a tremendously powerful tool because it's all transparency at, at full. Right? So I've been in companies, working in companies in which the CEO uh, is hardly beaten by a newbie engineer in something. I mean, it's, that's really cool. Uh, for also for the CEO, maybe at the beginning he doesn't feel like it, but it is. Um, so th when, whenever I go to uh, a place and uh, no, we are trying to become agile, so how transparent you are, and and when when I see how they think about the the Slack channels, or the especially the asynchronous channels, the mailing list. I go like, okay, you have a long way to go. In open source, we have that as a given, right? So taking that that we have in when it comes to transparency, this, this uh, action or whatever other, it's a very, very powerful thing. So it, it really helps when, when you think about big transformation processes of entire organizations. There are tons of other examples in which little things that we do that we take as a given in open source that are absolutely revolutionary when you take them at scale in organizations when it comes to transparency. So if we go to the principles, right, you can go to the 12 principles and I pick one because it affects me directly. The, you know, the principle number five hits directly to uh, the way we understand management, people management, but also project or product management. And there is a big shift that a manager has to go through when, when, when it does open source, when, when it's about open source. In most cases, you need to have one leg in your organization that has certain structures and their culture, and then one, he one foot, on your, one foot on, on your open source project that has a different culture, different structure. So you need to find a way in which you feel comfortable in both. No, you cannot switch. We, we are not that good, right? So instead of acting differently in when you are inside and outside, you have to find a way to act the same. And there are two, two elements that I, I, yeah, I recommend to, to go through. And every time I go to a new company and I have younger managers, uh, I try to explain them very early. And it's that uh, when we think about Agile uh, at scale, we have this idea of stop focusing on people, start focusing on the work, right? So uh, when you take that to uh, open source, in open source it's an environment in which autonomy is a given. There is no way you can control what people does, no matter if you have them sit here, right? It's, it's all about uh, let them do their thing, right? They are the executors, engineers are the executors, so they take the power. It's, it's all about pro giving power back to those who do stuff. So you have to, when you are a first, first level management or product management, product project manager, engineer manager, you have to go through this process of stop focusing on performance and productivity and, 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 and start to focus on where the real risks are and the risks in open source are focused completely on alignment. And it's alignment what you have to worry about. In an organization, usually alignment is a job of senior managers. Vision, mission, that's what executive does. Um, but, but alignment is about senior management. So you have to go through this learning process to move away from performance, from productivity, from deadlines, and move to a little bit more into alignment. It's a process that everybody has to go through. Now, when you think about Agile at scale, that is a process that you also have to go through. It's not so dramatic. But you have to also do a little bit of that, right? Stop focusing on people, start focusing on work. And also alignment becomes important because engineering teams has a lot of more freedom. They, they have a lot of more autonomy, which is a very good thing. Just another example. And if we think about the methodologies, I, I, yeah, I was thinking about which one I'm going to talk. And probably I'm going to talk one in that, that uh, it's not so obvious when you are in the commercial world, but when you are in open source, it's again a given. Um, we have this idea, uh, Agile is a lot about collocation. I mean, it used to be more than it is today, but it's a lot about collocation, right? Face-to-face -face interaction. And open source is 
is global. It's about being global. So you cannot assume face-to-face -face interaction. It's all about how we interact with each other and be efficient on an asynchronous environment, right? Uh, in which not necessarily you are together. I mean, you don't need. You cannot take as a given to be in the same time zone, right? And as a, as, as agile, the agile movement goes into m bigger and bigger companies and it becomes more and more popular. You know, you have these huge struggles on how to apply agile methodologies beyond your site, right? At a team level, that's fine, but uh, think about these production environments in which you have this, this company that has a very complex production pipeline because, you know, the, the, the environment is complex. They are trying to reduce it, but they have a functional, uh, they have a structure in which uh, they have functional separation that also I has involved uh, geographic separation. So you have the testers in one side, you have the integrators in another one, you have the, the guys in charge of the deployments in another one, or you have trans uh, mirror teams, right? So to cover uh, different geos. So it starts to get very complicated and, and, and they, s they really struggle on, on how to apply methodologies that are focused on teams that are collocated and, and they are end-to-end -end teams, right? So. As a, as a person that comes from open source, you go like, well, you know, we are global, so let's see what we can take. And there are tons of things that we, we, we take as a given that really, really, really help, right? So, for instance, um, I've been more than wise once in this situation in which I, I'm in control of the production pipeline and I start to go, okay, you know, let's, let's try to increase the working hours. You know, your lead times are significantly bigger than your working hours and you have a problem because the feedback loops are too big, uh, too long, sorry, and then you have to add the functional separation. Then, and you come from open source and several things you take as a given. In an open source project, the specialization is significantly lower than in a corporate environment. So you have this concept of T-shaped people. T-shaped people are much more by heart. You have to put your hands in different places and that's okay. And and also, you know, this idea that in that lean manufacturer brings into into software development, into agile, of uh, you have to be a specialist in your stage, but you also have to learn and know a little bit about your adjacent stages, because you know sometimes when you don't have any other choice, the on your only way of of, of uh, reducing bottlenecks might be to increase capacity urgently. Uh, you know, if you if you go to some Q uh, Q in uh, theory, that's that's. That's exactly the kind of problems they try to solve. So coming from open source, you don't have to teach that. You don't have to change people's mindset. You don't have to restructure. You know, people that come from open source has that as a given. It's a w the infrastructure is transparent, right? Uh, I can put my hands in different places. It's, it's expected, right? And, and working with time, time zones is also expected. I remember the KD4 days when I was uh, I had my, my laptop with an AMD 64. It was very, very new back then, right? And so I was basically testing the, the, the what all the, my colleagues were doing. So I had this uh, uh, CD burner and, and my laptop, and every morning I, I got into work, and as a side project, I simply have the, the image to download, and a spreadsheet with some te manual testing that I could do and then report, right? And I remember my shock by seeing that every single morning I had my, my image available because somebody in the US just took care of that. And then the people that were triaging all my, my, my problems were basically in the other side of the world. So I remember getting I mean, I was, I was in the Canary Islands, and we have one hour different with the mainland, and we had customers there, and we increased the shift by, you know, staying a little longer, and, and we did all that. Everybody does that. But, you know, doing this at scale globally, it's, it, it imp it's, it's it, yeah, it, you get it in. And, and when you go to the corporation, you say, well, we have the testers in India. I say, well, why? Have, do you have anybody in Colombia or in Venezuela or in Mexico? No. Why? You know, it's... You're going to improve your lead time significantly just by doing that. Um, okay. Yeah, and when I was thinking about skills or competences, you know, there are also tons of things you can pick up that young kids at the age of 20 that has been two or three, four years involved in open source, they have. And when you go to corporations that are, that has been even one or two years already 
into uh, these transformation processes and you talk to the developers there, even the younger developers who are who has less bias, right, on how the company works, they don't have. And and that helps tremendously in into this transition towards agility. And uh, when I look at uh, how colleges teach software engineering, um, uh, to me, it's, it's I, I don't get it. And the whole idea is that uh, you, you, you have imagined five, six subjects, right, in your first semester, and in the five of them, you do code for the five of them. And then the following semester, you threw that code away, and you start again, and, and you produce uh, other code. And then the following year, you do the same. So by the end of, the, of the your degree, you have not worked on your past code. There is always new code. So you don't have any clue about what is nurturing your old code and taking care of it and growing it. You have no clue. And then you get into this company and you start with somebody else's code. And, and you know, it, it might be only in when you get 30 or 32 years old, depending on the kind of company you get in, in which you're going to start to maintain your own code and maybe not even that. So when, when somebody comes, you know, some whoever, right? Yeah, we have to take ownership of our code. And people look at you and say, well, I have been taking ownership of my code my entire life. Well, you know, taking ownership of your code is a little more than just producing the code and having your name in the author, right, in the headers. When, when you see these kids with 20 years old or 22, right, and, and they are absolutely exposed when they do open source, absolutely exposed. And in some cases, they are producing code that is, that is shipped by the project and it's, it's, it's in millions of machines. And they have the next release, so they have to take care of their own code, right? So after a couple of years, they learn that a few things cannot be done. It doesn't matter how cool they are. They cannot be done, right? And so by the time they get into your company with 25 and you're going through this process, somebody comes and tells you, you know, you have to take ownership of your code. You have to write maintainable code. I say, well, I don't know if I write maintainable code. All I can say is that I have written some code that is in million, used by million people and I have had to uh, fix my own bugs because, you know, I have all these people screaming, right? So I always question why you need to put somebody in the customer support on the phone uh, when, when you have been in open source. I mean, I've seen that done in companies and I, I, I still don't get it. Um, I, I'm not saying it's bad. I'm just saying that you have to focus on other people probably, right? So there you have another example of that in open source you take as a given, that it, you learn that. And when you go to the company, uh, to a company, and, and, and they are going through this huge transformation that in some cases is so painful, in some others is so, re re um, is such a relief. Um, it's another th one of those things in which, uh, you know, you get there and say, I might not know Scrum, right? I have never done Scrum. I'm 30 and I, I have never done Scrum, right? But I, I'm suitable for the job. Are you guys moving? Yeah, we are moving into Agile, but we are looking for people that has done Scrum. And you go like, well, you know, I've been in open source for 10 years, so I don't know if, I don't know the, the methodology, right? It's true, I haven't worked there. It's going to take me some time. But look all, all what I have, right, that is so useful in these circumstances, right? So it's not a one or zero, right? This is that open source train us in transformation processes, in big software or engineering transformation processes, by working in, envir in by working in environments with st with strong values, right? That follows depending on the con each community has uh, different communities have different principles, but they share some, and those principles work also in in many cases in 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 agile companies or agile organizations, and then. You develop some, uh, y you are not very good at, at uh, uh, strict methodologies, but you have developed tons of practices that are actually very, very, very useful. And finally, you have got, you acquire certain skills, certain competences that can, in my opinion, beat anybody in any environment, right? So that's why, in general, my, my, my message always is that, uh, Open source is a uh, first class learning ecosystem for a lot of things. And many of those things uh, work beautifully in, in organizations that are trying to become agile, that are into this huge tsunami that, 
that has come a few years back in, t in cloud companies or in SaaS-based companies, and now is getting more and more into, into embedded, which is my, my, my main focus nowadays. So, so yeah, so if somebody tells you, if you are in a job interview and somebody tells you, we do Scrum, I say, well, I do open source, so what? Right. That was my, my take. Thank you. Yeah, any question then or comment? Ooh, one, two, three. Okay, let's start here then. Okay. Uh, hi. So, so I wasn't expecting to hear what I heard generally. Uh, I overall agree that definitely the companies should look at open source. Uh, so initially, I was expecting that how companies can use open source components in order to remove uh, commodity functionality from their responsibilities, and that will enable them their business. That is opportunity. Easy part. So, but 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 uh, I saw many generalizations. Like uh, I think I was making notes. Uh, so, your yeah, because I mean, uh, uh, like the key sor open source key values, like uh, the you were referring mainly. This was the th second or third slide. You were referring to rather open so open organiza or organizations. Uh, yeah, for example, consensus, transparency. I, I can think of many open source projects that are developed behind closed doors. They don't have these. It's uh, Android open source project, many Google open source projects. They don't have uh, these. They are very defined. They're very I I think that we down. should we should try to, I mean, there is no single way of doing open source. I agree. That's and why I found many gen arbitrary generalizations. But there is definitely one thing that I can say about your comment, and mm -hmm. it's Android is not open source. Yes, it is. It's MIT license or Apache license. What not. Well, uh, I think that in order to be open source, you need a little bit more than the license. It doesn't matter what me or you or Richard thinks. Uh, it's it's open source. It's. Uh, I I don't think so. I guess the code is open source, yeah, but yeah, it's yeah. not an open source project. Exactly. In any case, let let me let me refer to that. Word I put there was subjective. My okay, so I, I put that word subjective because uh, uh, you know these four can be different. And uh, and when I when I have uh, talked about the presentation with others, it was a little debate if transparency should go there, if is freedom is a consequence or is is really a value. I mean, yeah. So I, I decided to put um, subjective there. In any case, they are. I mean. They could be more, but definitely, in my opinion, they are. And yes, I said a lot of generalizations, but um, I, I stand by them. I, I stand behind them. Uh, so, switching subject completely, or, well, almost completely. Uh, you talked about uh, education, then, that you code for a bit, and then you throw it away, and code for a bit, and throw it away. Do you have any suggestions on how to, how to improve uh, education in programming? at schools and universities? Uh, okay, I, I, I was just, I, I do some training, and I, at some point, I, I, again, I, I had a training company. It was my first, uh, my first job, which is, yeah. And, and we were specialized in doing uh, IT training, and I'll, I don't know, half of our work was basically programming. And, uh, there, I, I got two conclusions from that period that that are that the time has not ruined completely. One of them is this one I mentioned about writing man maintainable code, which has a direct impact on costs. Which that's that's, and so I would like to see uh, teachers across uh, software engineering studies agreeing that at least some amount of, of subjects will reduce some amount of code because that is not a soft, a soft skill set, in my opinion. That is something that the company, not every company can train. You know, so, so you, you, yeah, there are many companies out there that cannot put a young guy to learn that. It, it, depending on the kind of company you have, it takes some time, right? So I think that it, ca it definitely can de mm, do better. And also in the company, when you focus, when you think about training in the companies, uh, I think the same way. So how, for me, it's always how we can train the young developers 
to, to write maintainable code yeah, by putting them in open source in, is, is my, my immediate answer. Yes. So, uh, yeah, that would be my, my immediate answer to that. Yeah, I would like to stick to the thing what you mentioned there in Agile Manifesto page, where you um, have the sentence that individual and interactions over processes and tools. And I can see here something which I uh, unfortunately see many, many times that, that uh, people think that, okay, that is team which I don't understand at all, because it actually says individuals. And m in many agile transformations where I have been part, is this same problem, that they don't understand that actually it's agile mindset in, in those individuals on those teams, which really counts. And, and that, is, that is something uh, what I would like to embrace more instead of hiding everything behind team concept. I completely agree. So, um, and the same applies to methodologies, right? So, yeah. and I'm, yeah, I'm, it's tough to, ar to arrive to a place that are, that are working so hard and uh, they are so passionate about m going into that transition. And as a consultant, going there and see how they are focused so much in teams and, and, and methodologies, which is, I wouldn't say that it's out of a point because at the very end, habits change mindsets, not the other way around. So by putting people into different habits is the best way to, to change the way they think. But uh, I think it has a lot to do with, with effort, right? It's significantly simpler to, to promote methodologies within teams than anything else. And so probably it's the first step. And, and I you can get great results, right? But I, I completely agree. So one of the things when coming from open source is insisting on individuals and interactions. And then it's very popular, well, that's, that's what the Agile Manifesto says. And then you go, yes, yeah, exactly. It's the concept of community has some additional uh, implications, some additional implications. But yeah, I, I completely agree with you. the the kind of the importance to remove the waste and and really continuously think the value focus and and it's it's all about the the every practical thing what you do every day so that that is many times really badly uh, jeopardized and it's something like okay team will solve everything yeah uh, thank you very much great speech uh, oh I, by the way I I saw your talk yesterday. Yeah, I liked it. Thank you. <laughs> uh, so I was a bit stuck on on the remote teams. Uh, mm -hmm. So for me, I've worked with within and and with several teams that work remote and uh, several teams that that works on site. Uh, from my experience, the remote teams can work, uh, but the on site teams always works better. From from my view, do you think it's a trend that that we're going to see that there are more uh, distributed teams, and is that possible to make as good as on-site teams? Um, I think that is an in unstoppable trend. Trend, and uh, this is a conversation that I have had the last four four years, time after time, so many times. And um, my in my previous job, I was uh, the director of a department in 50, uh, around 50 people, nine time zones, 15 countries, fully distributed company. And the challenges there are huge in terms of management. But the point is that as organization, uh, you need to develop new skills, right? But so you might say, well, you know, this is not what we want. It seems harder, right? But then you look at the trend of how te where technology is taking you. Uh, and the social, uh, yeah, the, 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 the how the workplace is changing and how uh, we are empowering the doers. So the talent, it's, it's, uh, it's starting to be so limited in so, ma so many areas that engineers can decide where to work up to some point. So to me, 
coming from the Canary Islands, which is a special environment because more, more islands, group of islands out there has a big central island and then the small ones, so you can work in land. And the Canary Islands have two equally big and relevant islands, so you end up working in one all the time. You, you, a hundred people company will have two sides, so yeah. So coming from there, for us it was a natural thing that we, I, I have been able to, 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 to scale up in, in open source. But I think it's, it's unstoppable. Now, I don't know, I have worked in uh, distributed environments that works very well. And compare them to co-located environments. Uh, the I, I've seen so many companies that they think they are doing a good job in in in, in managing remote teams, and they are terrible. And when I see the management and I look at the experience they have, and it's so little in general that I think it's not a fair comparison. Now, yes, if if you feel comfortable with co-located environment, just keep doing that. Try to avoid it as much as possible. You know, and I always recommend that uh, try a fully distributed team. Try to avoid the mixed environment as much as you can, because that's the harder one. And then also, a lot of people mix the geo distribution with the multicultural uh, factor, right? With uh, the change in infrastructure tooling and some kind, sometimes even with heavy changes in processes. When the, so it's like too many changes at once, right? So it's like, no, let's go remote. And suddenly you cannot access the HR tool or you are working the whole day with a VPN. It's like, man, this. So I, I, am, not, I am not saying that you are wrong, okay? It's, it works for you, fine. My experience is a little bit different. I'd like to hear your thoughts about, you talk about a lot of processes and about uh, going, how to manage people. My view is that we should stop controlling people and more focus on giving the right circumstances and let people actually do the job and remove obstacles instead of controlling and try to optimize time because that will people do it ourselves. What are your thoughts about that? Well, when I think about Agile, I think a big fundamental point of Agile is going into that direction, right? And when I think about open source, um, it was designed like that. So it was designed to keep people of like me completely <laughs> away from the day-to-day -day, uh, daily work from engineers, which I perfectly understand. Um, so I completely agree. Now, the question is how you, uh, you have uh, trained a workforce in the culture of controlling the people, and by controlling the people, you control the work, right? and how you move them away from that. And if you think about it, focusing, uh, it's, it's, it's very common that you focus a lot of the energy when you go into Agile into engineering, assuming that managers will just simply adapt by, by, by science, right? Maybe the project managers, you put them into scrum courses, maybe the product managers, you turn them into product owners, right? And, but that's it, that second level senior management, you learn, right? And yeah, that's that's something that uh, I've seen many many times, and and it needs to change. Okay, thank you. <laughs> I, I didn't try to do this.